Today we're in God is Love series. We're, we're walking through a little bit to kind of explain and understand, first of all, how God loves us, but how we should love other people. And we learn that, and we should learn that in our Christian walk through how Jesus loved people. He showed us how to live, and the whole concept of a Christian, the definition is one who follows Christ, one who follows Him in how He did life. And um, we all know the end of that story. He died for us. He sacrificed Himself. Um, I'm not, again, giving anything away by what's going to happen Easter weekend. Um, we're going to have a crucifixion service Friday night talking about the crucifixion of Jesus. And then Sunday morning we'll have two services talking about the resurrection, the celebration of, of what happens when um, God loves us so much. But today we find ourselves in um, one of my favorite stories in John chapter 11. And again, it's very well known. I have preached this so many times and I have preached it from the angle of when Lazarus comes forth and, and the first thing Jesus tells them is take off the grave clothes so he can walk. He, he doesn't need that anymore. He's not dead. He does not need what he had. He needs his life, this new life. And I've preached on that so many times about how many of us are living with these grave clothes on. I love that. It's awesome. He's telling us to strip it off because it's, it's containing, it's, it's um, restricting. And so many times in our life, we leave those things in our past on us while we were dead, yet now we're alive. Well, today I'm taking a, a complete different angle because I think there's a lot of interesting things about this story that we may just kind of dismiss because of the coolness of someone being raised from the dead. I mean, that's pretty cool. That's pretty amazing. I have not ever seen that in my life. I don't know if you have. If you have, I want to hear about it because that's pretty crazy. That's all I, I can say about it. This whole biblical example of Jesus is love towards those he loves the most. Those people he spent his time with, he had love for them. He had love for Martha and Mary and Lazarus and his disciples. He showed that love. He was a, a human. He, he had human emotions. And then he had all of that. He was all human, yet he was all God. And that struggle, I, I just cannot imagine the struggle he had in every situation. Am I going to act, can I, can I withhold godliness and can, or can I withhold my human nature? I mean, I can fix everything. I can heal anything. I can, I can change anything. But what am I called to do? Every day, I believe he got up and said, what is my calling? I believe he spent time with God saying, what do you want? What is your will? It's kind of interesting that maybe that's what we should be doing as well, right? Not what I want, but what he wants. So Jesus found out that Lazarus was sick. And he was not in the town where Lazarus was sick. He was very sick, yet he stayed an additional two days after he found out Lazarus was sick. And then when he was ready, he told his disciples, we'll go now to see Lazarus. And they were like, yeah, finally. And he's like, well, let me tell you. He, he's already dead. And this is the disciples' friends. And we were like, how, how close really were they with Lazarus? Let me read to you verse 16 and 17 of John 11. And it says, so Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, right after Jesus said, Lazarus is already dead, he says, let us also go that we may die with him. That's like right out of a movie, isn't it? Let's go die with those who died. That's brotherhood. That's battle worthy. We're going to rush them. And I don't care who dies. If he dies first, I'm going to go die with him. That's the love they had for each other. That brings it to a whole nother level, in my opinion, of what they thought of Lazarus. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus has already been in the tomb Four days once he got there. And the first person he meets up with to talk to is 
Martha. He knows Martha. He's been around Martha, one of Lazarus' sisters, very close to Jesus. And Martha said to Jesus in chapter uh, 11, verses 21 through 23, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, he will give it to you. Because I know that you're the son of God. And I know when you ask, he delivers. I know that. I believe that. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Now there was a little misinterpretation of that. Because the next verse she began to talk and he was like, I know he's going to rise again in the new heaven and the new earth, but I just wish you would have been here because he would have not died on this earth yet. Second, he talks to Mary with a crowd of people. See, Mary is crying, and then Martha goes and says, hey, Jesus is here. He wants to see you. She goes out. Well, guess what? The morning crowd, the, you, know, I don't, you kind of paid for some people to be there. It's really weird in our culture to think about this. But when someone died, you had a bunch of people come and they would cry with you. Okay, that's kind of bizarre. I, I realize that. You're like, okay, thanks for coming. Thanks for crying. Thanks, you know. But there was some that were crying because they knew him. Some were just because this is a sad deal. They were very well known. So when Martha comes to Mary and says, Jesus wants to talk with you. Well, then the crowd's like, well, we, we're not going to stay here. We're going to go and see what's up. I want to see what Jesus is going to do. I want to see what Jesus is going to say. I want to, some are like, I want to critique him. I want to see what he's going to do wrong or what I disagree with. So now when Mary came to where Jesus was, this is in verses 32 through 37, she saw him and she fell at his feet saying to him, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see him. And Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying see they weren't even talking he could raise him they're like couldn't he have just kept him from dying i mean come on he's distraught the sisters are distraught we know how much he loved him why couldn't he have just kept him from dying verses 38 through 44 read then jesus deeply moved again came to the tomb it was a cave and a stone laid against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. And Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. I don't know if that's the best decision. It's not going to be pretty. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone and Jesus lifted up his eyes. And said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I love this because is Jesus necessarily requesting of God or is he thanking him for what he already knows he's going to do? Well, I learned a few years ago that we need to, I need to stop asking for God's forgiveness and start thanking him for it. Because it's been done. God has the power. God has the glory. God has Everything that we need already, he's, he's given it. We sometimes just need to thank him. And he says, thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me. But I say this on the account of these people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. It's not for me, it's for them. It's not for me, it's for them. My life is not for me. My life is for them. My comfort is not for me. My comfort, it's for them. I'm not here for me. I'm here for them. At the garden, I don't want this to happen, but your will be done, not mine. That should almost resonate through our minds throughout Easter. Because we normally want what we want, not what you want i'm going to take care of myself before i take care of you 
I care about you. I, I love you. I like you. But I like myself a lot more. I would be a lot worse off if I died than you died. Right? I want to stay alive. I want good things to happen to me. I'm going to be sad if bad things happen to you. And I'm going to cry with you. But I'm kind of glad it's not me. We won't raise our hands if we ever believe that. Because I know we've all been there. So, when he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And I guarantee you at that point in time, with that crowd, with Mary and Martha, they've been looking at Jesus, and he says, Lazarus, come out. I guarantee you they all stop looking at Jesus. Or God, or crying, or thinking, it's so sad. And they were like, ah. I'm like, let's, let's check out the grave because I want to see. I mean, all these people, they were sitting there. He's opened the eyes of the blind man. And why couldn't he have kept this guy from dying? And now they're probably thinking, he's really thinking he's going to raise a dead man from the grave four days in the grave? I mean, it's not like, does he still have a pulse? Is he flatlining for five minutes? Is he a lack of oxygen? Yeah, he's dead. He's decomposing almost. At the, I mean, it's like, it's getting there. It's horrible. The man who had died came out, his hands, his feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Because he's not dead. He's alive because God did it. All glory be to him. He will rise again. It didn't matter. Time doesn't matter. When you think I should arrive, when you think it's best for me to show up, it doesn't matter. I'm doing exactly what God has for me. And what he has for me to do will glorify himself beyond your comfort. It's so hard for me not to talk about Lazarus right now. Because I'm, gonna, I'm switching to a different part and, and different view of this scripture. So, although amazing, correct? Would you, I mean, this is like one of the most amazing stories in the Gospels outside the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ that we can talk about, I think. It's exciting. It's like, man, if I, I mean, you have the death and resurrection of Jesus, you have Lazarus, and you have Jesus walking on the water. I think, in my opinion, those are like, it just doesn't happen. You don't see people walking on the water. You don't see people raised from the dead. It still brings up some interesting questions about Jesus if you really Look at it. I mean, on the surface, people read this like, yeah, I mean, Jesus is awesome, man. He raised Lazarus from the dead. He loves his friends. But how many people today, as Christ, even Christians, not just, non, not just the people who don't come to church, you know, but those in the church would murmur at Jesus for kind of callously letting Lazarus die and putting him, Mary, and Martha, and others through the pain of him dying. I mean, sickness, death, and then waiting on Jesus. I mean, you think he's coming today? Maybe it's tomorrow. Okay. He, he, he's not here. And then the third day, him, the, by the fourth day, they're probably thinking he's not coming. I mean, you wait four days on something. It's like an overnight package, you know, when you like, you pay for overnight, and then it doesn't come for four days. It's kind of depressing. You kind of get a little agitated. You kind of call Amazon and be like, what's up with that? I was told about 15 years ago, I'm sorry, that yeah, Clovis overnight is two days. Sorry. So I never expected overnight. I don't know about, I don't know if you've heard that, but reality is harsh, guys. You don't get overnight here. I don't, you can pay it. Yeah. Pay for it. Do that and get it in two days. You know, so they're like waiting for, G now it's like four days past. They're not like, the package isn't coming. We're going to have to deal with this on our own. We're mourning on our own. He is not coming. So the misery of those days, and yet if they saw, if we could see that this was motivated by Jesus' desire to magnify the glory of God. It was not about Lazarus. It was not about 
Mary and Martha. It wasn't about Jesus and his emotional attachment to his friends. Or even Thomas, who said, let's go die with him because this is horrible news. What's funny is Thomas didn't say, let's go die with Jesus, did he? (laughs) They were running by then, right? This is a few weeks later. They were like, okay, I said, let's die with with Lazarus. Let's don't die with Jesus, man. They're going to kill him. Let's run the other way. I lost my place. Sorry. Here we go. So this desire to magnify God's glory, many would call this harsh and unloving. You, you let suffering happen. How many times in our lives we're like, God, why did you make me suffer? Why did you let these people suffer? If, you were gonna, if they were going to die anyway, why didn't you just have them die instead of ha- have this disease that just ate up everything? Or they lost their mind and they were yelling at their family and horrible and they, they became who they never have been. Why? Why? Why would he do this? And what this does show, unfortunately, which again, I don't like to preach in this scripture like this, but I think it's mandatory to understand as we understand the love of God and that He is love, is what this shows is how far above the glory of God people value pain-free living and comfort. How far above glorifying God that we want our lives to be comfortable and and good and happy. It's a lot more fun to hang out with people with no problems that are like you and think like you and laugh at your jokes and like the same TV shows that they're going to call and they're never going to have problems. They're never going to need your help. They're never going to have to move you know, 18 pieces of oak furniture and three grand pianos. They're never going to call you and they're going to run out of gas. They're never going to have sick kids or one going to the hospital that you have to run to their house and grab their kids. They're never going to run out of food or money or pro. They just, that's easy. Jesus, man, he got, he rolled up his sleeves and just got into people's lives. And he loved them enough to weep with them, but he also loved them enough to say, this is about God. And I know that he's like, I know no one understands this. Even the night before he was crucified, they didn't understand. They're like, yeah, Jesus is like letting people die. He's, he's doing all this crazy stuff. And then they see, man, he's going himself. He's living it out. Human love defined is for most people love is whatever puts human value and human well-being at the center is human love so because of this belief jesus's behavior in this story is almost unintelligible to us we don't understand why did he just not run lazarus is sick get on the camels i don't know what they had you know let's get on there let's don't walk let's rent some Horses and camels, we got to get there. Lazarus is sick. He's my friend. Mary, Martha, they're freaking out. Let's get there. He heard it and he just stayed. Doesn't make sense. God's love defined what brings most glory to himself. So if Jesus is God and he is all knowing and already knows what's about to happen, We would all agree with that. Why did he cry? The shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. He felt horrible. He he just, the emotions overcame him. Has that ever happened to you? There's a a cup, there's there's few possibilities of this. I'm going to talk about two. One reason for Jesus' tears could very well be because a very close friend died. And that's enough to bring you to tears. And being very close to Martha and being very close to Mary, and they are crying, it's in the moment. He is all human. Who could not stand there and just be like, man, I'm really sorry Lazarus died. And it's for the glory of God. 
and he will be raised again. I mean, he is in their lives, and it's a mess, and their, their brother's dead. And they were good friends, and when good friends are hurting, it hurts us as well. That's a great gauge is how close you are to someone when they have suffering in their life is how much it hurts you. If it doesn't hurt you at all, then you're not very close to them. You may act like it, you may think you are, but if it doesn't hurt you inside, then you're not that close to them. And Jesus was very close to them. So that is one, because of his love for them, his human love for his friends. I don't know that that's the only reason he was crying. I like to think that it's the second possibility. A reason for Jesus' tears was that he knew that raising Lazarus from the dead in front of a crowd would actually cause the religious leaders to finally take action to put him to death. They were building a case against Jesus. You raise someone from the dead, red flags, baby. They have something else. He is a heretic. He is raising people from the dead. We can't have that. What's going to happen? I mean, they're going to just empty the graveyards? Come on, we can't have that. In this account, most of us probably marvel at Jesus' incredible trust that his father would answer him, and that is little faith. If Jesus had any struggle that day, it would have not been whether his father would answer, but what would the result of his father answering be? I mean, just the first step is Lazarus coming out of the grave. The second is everybody telling everyone else. The third is is those religious leaders have a case and they're going to take him to the cross. Calling Lazarus out of the tomb would have taken a different kind of resolve for Jesus than we might have imagined. Giving Lazarus life was sealing Jesus' own death. And maybe because he was human, that got him a little bit emotional. Just these few reasons... There's others for Jesus weeping at Lazarus' tomb gives us a glimpse into how God views our suffering and our death. His reasons for not sparing us, and these reasons are glorious and righteous, and we may not understand them here on this earth, but in them He is full of compassion, and He hates what sin brings about, and He Himself has suffered more than we'll ever know in order to pay The full cost of our eternal redemption. Our life. Our eternal life. What He has cost Him. Psalms 30 verse 5 says, Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. And when the morning comes, Revelations 21, 4 says, Death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning or crying or pain any more. I mean, I just think of children. We're just children. We're just sheep. When something catastrophic in your child's life happens and they just think there's no way to recover, I mean, we feel compassion, but it is kind of funny, right? Sometimes it's like, this isn't the worst that's ever going to happen to you, kid. Your friend didn't sit by you, they took your milk. You made a B. You wrecked on your scooter. Right? But to them, it's like, (gasps) my life is over. I had a bad hair day. I'm like, look at my hair. I have a bad hair life. You're okay. It's one day. We can fix it. And we take this stuff to God in prayer. I mean, think about it. He's looking at us like, You're going to be okay. You know what? Even if it kills you, you're better off because you're with me. So whatever happens in your life, it is for this limited amount of time as compared to eternity. So I think the majority of my prayers, I mean, I don't, I like to think about it now because I'm not like, like in prayer right now praying that God take me out of some situation, but I think God can just be like trying to hold back the laughter a little bit like, okay, Derek, 
okay, finish your prayer and it's going to be okay. I, I, prom- I got this. Regardless of what's happening, I got this. This love that Christ shows us is the love we should show others. This compassion in the midst of heartache is the love that reveals our heart. It revealed Jesus' heart to these people when he began to cry and to feel this compassion for his friends. A hard love is when things don't seem right and when we are engulfed in suffering that we remember three things. God is love. God loves us. And we are to love others. All the time. And even deeper than that in this story is is this. Our comfort is not our calling. The love of God is our calling. Above all things we show love and know that God will call you out of comfort to do His will. It's every time. His will is not in your comfort. His glory, Him being glorified, the gospel being propelled, a church growing, a family getting together, um, reconciled relationships are not happening in our comfort. They happen outside of our comfort. That's our calling. And as long as we're comfortable, we're not going for our calling. Period. That's biblical. But we have skewed that in our churches. Saying, yeah, you can love Jesus and everything's going to be okay. And that everything's going to be okay, you can translate that however you want. And you're going to be okay. God will give you what you want. Name it. Claim it. And live a happy life. Your comfort is not His calling on your life. And I, begin, I believe we begin to understand the love of God more and more the closer we draw to Easter. And next week, we're going to talk about Jesus' love for Judas. The man we all love to hate, right? Who would do that? My prayer is that we would focus on the cross and the resurrection. We would understand it a little more. We would go a little deeper with what does God want? How how does He want to be glorified in my life? And how am I fighting that? Because of my comfort. I mean, I'm, I'm guilty. We're all guilty of that in different areas. And we, in a way, we are like Lazarus coming out of the grave, and we still want to hold on to some of that stinky grave clothes. And Jesus is like, just take them off so you can be free. You, you are alive. Now, walk in that. You know, the, the most interesting thing, few, few, small percentage of any of us, God will call us to die for Him. But most, if not all, he'll ask us to live for him. And that's, that's his request. In every situation, just as Jesus did, what is your will? Thank you for what you're doing. What do I need to do today? Who do I need to meet? Where do I need to go? We would live for him. Let's stand. We're going to pray. We're going to sing. Uh, we're going to close this out. God, we do thank you so much for your love And how you are loved, God. You have expressed it. You have written it. You have manifested it in our lives. And you have created it within each and every one of us. And God, I pray that we would be in the business of showing you off. That if it takes getting uncomfortable in our lives and in our words and our actions, that we would go walk in that. Because most of the time, it's where we find you is, is the, the times and places where it's inconvenient. We don't have the time. And yet you open up and reveal something to us 
in someone else's life. And God, I thank you for those times and those moments. And as a church, I pray that we would reach out beyond our borders, our, beyond our walls, beyond our comfort, and we would be about you and the, your glory and what you want to see happen. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.